And now, coming to you from the Pensado Media Center, powered by Westlake Pro. Our guest is an audio expert and has had a huge influence on folks like Stevie Wonder, Talking Heads, Depeche Mode. You're going to learn a lot. We've got the winners of the Indaba Pensado Contest. Good stuff there. And it's the Happy New Year show. Happy New Year. You're at the place. It's Pensado's place. Yeah. Uh, I'm turkeyed out. I yeah. turned turkey into a bird. <laughs> I'm turkeyed out. Turkeyed out, <laughs> hammed out, whatever out. But you know what? Uh, a nam's coming up. Nam's coming that's, up. That's, that's my Christmas. Absolutely, and we got some. And uh, my vacation for the uh, last year. No, I year. call it day <laughs> Super Bowl. <laughs> it's absolutely, man. Watching you at those things like watching oh, Brady man, on the so football much, field. So much fun. So yeah. much fun. So much fun. You guys come hang out with us. We got some information yeah, for them. We got right? some cool stuff. Right. Cool stuff. Uh, shall I shall I move forward? Please. Good. Hey guys, uh, happy New Year. Um, we're in the you know middle of the holiday season, and again, we encourage you to take a moment. Um, again, Dave and I want to tell you how much we appreciate you and wish you a happy new year. And Absolutely. we got some good stuff planned for you. Happy new year, also to the best partners in the world: the Blackbird Academy, Westlake Pro, DTS, Lander, Avid, Recording Connection, Studio Two Hundred Two DC. And our boys at Audio Dynamics, we like them as well too, yeah, right? Of course. And our ladies. And our ladies, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, we it's a long way today. Um, the really cool Indaba Pensado contest, which by the way, there's going to be more of them through the year. Uh, we've Dave has been uh, in his cave in the lair, doing the studying and figuring it out. He's mm -hmm. picked some winners. Remember that's uh, the cool band that, that out of Brooklyn. Jesus on the main line. It's almost a collective. Yeah, the song's no, called the only band with their own zip code. Yeah, I mean literally, the band <laughs> has its own zip code. Absolutely. <laughs> and when it moves around, it sucks up other zip codes. There's uh, a lot of them. A lot they're of so them. amazing. Really talented. The yeah. track is called "Always with Me." Yeah. Uh, Converse Rubber Tracks and all that they do at Indaba and all that they do with us yeah. and they do for you. And apparently, you guys have been extraordinary, Dave. Had a tough job this year. All these prizes, these folks are going to get from great companies, Audio Dynamics and. Uh, Isotope and, and Lander and people are going to come on the show on Pensado's Place and so on and so forth. So DP, I know how seriously you take this. Talk mm -hmm. to me about it. Well, um, the three winners were separate by one point apiece. Wow. And wow. the gap between, uh, and this is based on a 100 point system with yeah. 10 different categories of 10 each. Right. And um, the gap between the winner and, and, and number 10 was I think only about six or seven, oh, maybe that's eight. Amazing. It, it was really that's tight. That's how good you guys yeah. are. Yeah, absolutely. Um, some great, great stuff. Uh, oh, there, there were every every person of of the ten I judged. There was always something that they did better than the other nine, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so it became a question. That would of, make it tough to it, well, pick a winner, right? My system is kind of neat, you know. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I hate to say that, but uh, no, I like to say that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was tough. Yeah. Um, Category number nine is, did I like it? Mm. And so um, <clears throat> that made it even tougher. But um, I, 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 a lot of maturity yeah. in, in the work now. And, and not an easy track either. No, <clears throat> no, this one separated the men from the boys. Absolutely, and, and the girls from the women. So let's, let's do some winners. We'll okay. go from third, second to grand prize, right? Okay. Number three, drum roll. <laughs> Well, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's either F Rocks or Frocks, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, F R O X, number three. Frocks, good for you. Number two. Bruno Chavez. Bruno, Bruno Chavez. Chavez. Wow, his, yeah. his, both of his names have impact and historical know, impact. And, gra and the grand prize winner is uh, Alberto. Mioto. Ooh. Alberto Mioto. I want to borrow Alberto that. Alberto Mioto. <laughs> one Alberto, of Alberto, M-I-O-T-T-O. One of those guys. I hope he's Italiano. Uh, but uh, I'm telling you what, Alberto, you killed it. Um, Frox, if that's the way you pronounce your name, F. Frox. Um, super stuff. Um, Bruno. Bruno killed Bruno it. Bruno had my favorite vibe. I mean, mm. he, uh, one of my categories is inventiveness, and, and all three of these were inventive and... Uh, 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 the, the, 
you know how when they judge certain things at the Olympics, they have technical yeah. and then creative yeah, kind yeah. of things? Yeah. And, and the technical, everybody did good. It, the separating factor in, in the winners was um, the creative things, you know, right. like, like in, inventive panning, inventive uh, use of effects. And wow. uh, everybody EQ'd good, everybody compressed good. Um, I'm real proud of you guys, man. You guys really, really did a great, great, great job. Great job, guys. It's, um, uh, it was, this was fun for me. And by the way, um, two things. One, he doesn't give faint praise. Uh, I've known him for a long time. Um, and two, what I want you guys to know is how seriously he takes your work. You're not wasting it at all. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of good things. So good job with you, my man. Thank you. Uh, um, if I can put a footnote in, um, on some of these contests, some people will email me, you know, what did what did I do wrong? What did I do good? I, I wish I had time to, to answer each one of you individually, but if I do one, I got to do all 500 of you, and, and I don't have that kind of time. But if you sign up for the Pensado Village, <laughs> oh no, sorry, that, that's another thing, something's uh, coming. Uh, uh, but um, uh, this was probably the most fun I had judging because I didn't have to work. I got to listen to some really good music the music was um, a little out of what a, a lot of our audience, I'm guessing, is into. And um, um, it, it, it was kind of neat. It, I, I, don't, I don't know how to describe it. But I was really, really prideful when I was uh, about you guys, and, and almost like a mother mm -hmm. uh, seeing the uh, child at a recital or something, you know, like you're holding your breath that they won't make a mistake. Right, so anyway, that. thanks a lot for that and let me be a part of it. You guys did a great job, not just the top three, but all of you guys. So congrats to all you guys, Indaba, Converse Rubber Tracks for bringing it. We'll have another one coming up reasonably soon. Stay Can't tuned. Jesus on the main line. You did your thing. Yeah, Keep thanks, it up. Guys. We want to see you someday when you're in L.A. And uh, we'll get those prizes fulfilled to you really soon. Great job. Um, coming up as well, NAM. Uh, our perspective beyond the size of it, a great place to deal with community, a great place to meet people, a great place to get your information up on gear that's available. A great place to come see Pensado's place, which will be at a number of places. The Avid booth, we will be there from 1 to 2, 2.30 every day. We got some great guests. We can announce two of them. We can't do the third one yet. One of them is Jimmy Douglas, I think on Thursday. Yeah. Butch Vig, which is a monster guest on Friday. And Saturday, stay tuned. They're, they're, it's it's going to be really cool. Come by there. Um, we're also going to do another show at the Audionamics booth on Saturday and a big hang. We'll get you those details. So right now we're just saying carve out 19 through 21 in January. Come hang out. Be a bunch of peers, a bunch of stars, a bunch of stuff. It's yeah, a good time. A little bit of a public service announcement. Uh, before and after the Avid appearance, there's a person supposedly that's going to be looking a lot like me that's going to be walking around, but that's not me. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. Before and after, so. If we you send your doppelganger in. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah, so, so, so. so when you go so, out, just yeah. say doppelganger. So because yeah. of that fact, stop him, ask him anything you want, and uh, if he gives you bad answers, I'll straighten it out later. If you see a black guy in a polo shirt, it's not me. <laughs> uh, so, so we'll see you at NAMM. Um, that wasn't funny. But, <laughs> but it was, it was, it was a it good try. To, hey, it's New be. Year's. We've had a little eggnog. We're having a good time. Uh, our guest today. We had a conversation a couple weeks back with a guy oh. who literally from his influences with Stevie Wonder and Talking Heads and David Byrne and a bunch of things to just his badassery in terms of mm -hmm. synthesized music, how much he was at the forefront of that um, as an audio pioneer. Five Stevie Wonder number one albums in a row. Five Stevie Wonder including number one albums in a row. Including all the good ones. And Stevie, sure. Steve, we know Stevie a little bit and Stevie doesn't Stevie's careful about who he picks. So take a moment and meet somebody who really has affected you in ways that you never knew. Yeah. Uh, here's our conversation with Bob Margoliff. Bob. Uh, legends don't quite get this. If you think about, when you hear about the records this gentleman has worked on and the music, you start with Stevie Wonder and you sort of end with Jesus. Like it's just, <laughs> uh, and everything in between. We have. Uh, uh, been looking forward to this. We you, we've been debating. We've been trying to get him for a minute, right? And and it's finally worked out. Yeah. So welcome to the place, Mr. Bob Margolin. Hey, thank Bob. you very very much. How are you, man? Happy to my, see my you, friend Robert. Happy uh, to have uh, you. Good, good, good. Bob, I'm gonna use this opportunity 
for you to tell me the correct pronunciation of M O O G. Your good friends Moog. with the man. Moog. So it's yeah. Moog. Okay. Bob Moog. Okay. Moog. All right. So some people has... say Moog. Yep. What did he say? Uh, he said Moog. He said Moog. The last time, the uh, uh, we did just before he passed away. I guess about maybe a few months before. We did a show at the Smithsonian called The Keyboard Meets Electronica. Oh, wow. And it was me and Malcolm and um, Keith Emerson and Malcolm Bob. Cecil. Wow. Yeah. And um, wow. he said Moog. Gotcha. That show. So and I, as long as somebody bought it, yeah. <laughs> it would be okay. Man, take me back. Uh, how, do, how, did you, how did you get to work with Stevie Wonder and how did... How did Explain the climate during that uh, Like, what the hell happened? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, synthesizers were not acceptable totally, and well, it made them not just acceptable, but musical. Well, you know, there was a lot of electronic music going on, but it was going on at the uh, Columbia Music Lab. It was guys in white coats mm -hmm. with pencil protectors. Mm -hmm. Now, Bob Moog loved pencil protectors. <laughs> he, was a, he was an engineer first uh -huh. and sure. foremost, more than being a musician, mm -hmm. okay, he first and foremost was an engineer, mm -hmm. and a really, really good one. Mm -hmm. um, uh, really what happened is Bob Moog was able to define a musical instrument, a synthesizer, basically, mm -hmm. uh, that wasn't the lab experiment, mm -hmm. but it was, you were able to use it as a musical instrument, mm -hmm. and it became accessible to to play on. Mm -hmm. The real question was how to bring it forward. Right. And um, I think that that was a big sort of defin defining space, a disruptor as I call it. Was Stevie music attracted business. to that? Yeah. Yeah. Is, is I was immediately attracted to right, it. Right. I was busy in New York at that time. Uh -huh. I was living in New York. I was busy making underground movies. I was making a film called Chow Manhattan. Oh, well, yeah. It was, uh, featured Edie Sedgwick, Jane Holzer, cool. Alan Ginsberg, Paul America, Viva. Wow. Uh, okay. A lot of crazy people. Maxis, Kansas City. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, the completely insane scene. Mm -hmm. Hair was on Broadway. Wow. Um, Dr. Feelgood was poking everyone up with vitamin shots. Mm -hmm. The um, mm -hmm. Jefferson Airplane opened the Fillmore East, mm -hmm. and I went to a strange club called uh, Cerebrum, and I walked up there and I heard this strange bleeping and blooping, and I didn't know what it was, and I looked up and there was a, a piece of a Moog synthesizer, a, a damaged Moog synthesizer, playing under the DJ booth. And I said, you know, that this is the greatest thing I could ever possibly think of to make the music for Chow Manhattan, because mm -hmm. I wanted to do something different. And I ended up ditching the movie, basically, and playing the synthesizer. I was completely, completely a uh, prisoner of the synthesizer. Probably I did. loved it. Probably did. And the thing I loved about it is, and I, I have to say a misnomer, mm -hmm. it's not a device that, uh, first of all, it's not a machine, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Like they say, the drum machine, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's not a machine. It has no moving parts, mm -hmm. right? How mm -hmm. can you call it a machine? Mm -hmm. But... Um, I spent about two and a half or three years trying to figure out and how to play it. There was no school you could go to and there were no books written about it. And they were complex as hell too. They were complex yeah. and the thing is you had to learn on your own what to do with it and how to define it. I didn't know whether I was even making music. Um, but one thing led to another and I... Uh, did you introduce that to Stevie or did uh, Well, it happened strangely. I ended up... Um, uh, putting the film away, basically, and someone else finished, a guy named David Weissman, who went mm -hmm. on to produce Kiss of the Spider Woman, mm -hmm. strangely enough. Um, but uh, one thing led to another, and I ended up uh, in the kind of securitous route at a place called Media Sound in New York on mm -hmm. 57th Street. And during the day, it was television commercials. And at night, it was closed. Mm. Why? Because the musicians were all getting double time. And if they wanted a commercial sponsor, wanted to pay double time for musicians, they would work at night, right? So no one worked at night. I became the studio uh, bad boy mm. and the synthesis in command, uh, one of the few. And uh, I was already working on a very strange record on my own. Um, and I met Malcolm Cecil at that studio. He was the night time. maintenance man. And um, we got together and I said, you know, Malcolm, I'm not even sure I'm making music. He says, listen, we'll just do a few edits. You'll really, it, it's good. 
And Herbie Mann heard what we were doing. It was really off the wall stuff, okay? I even rearranged the tone rows. It was not even 12 tone scale, okay? There were notes in between the notes, right? And we made this strange album. It was called uh, Zero Time, and it was the, we decided to call ourselves Tonto's Expanding Headband. Mm -hmm. Tonto, the original neo timbral orchestra. And uh, Herbie Mann said, hey kid, I have a big joint sticking out of my mouth, my hair long. Mm -hmm. And he says, I'll give you five grand. Go and finish your record. You do it. Bob uh, Walters, who owned the studio, said, since there's nobody working at night, and Malcolm's the night maintenance man anyway, Allen Log Studio, of course, it starts breaking the minute you turn on the equipment. It's all analog, <laughs> right? So Malcolm would be running around trimming up the tape recorders and fixing stuff at night. But I had this, this it was in an old church, and we pulled in the synthesizer on a gurney. And I would play at night with Malcolm. And slowly but surely, we ended up making a record called Zero Time, and Herbie released it on his... Uh, on his uh, Stevie heard it. Stevie heard it. It got a big review in Rolling Stone, and I, oh, wow. I was completely shocked. We got a five thousand dollar advance for the record, mm -hmm. and uh, Malcolm called me once. He said Malcolm lived above the studio, just off to the right of the front door on the third floor, and we were up there on a Sunday afternoon, and there was a, the st bell started ringing in the studio, and we looked down there, and there was Stevie in a chartreuse jumpsuit with Ronnie Blanco, who was one of Malcolm, Malcolm's first class musician and not a technician as well. And there's Ronnie Blanco standing there with Stevie. And Stevie had his album under our arm, Ooh. under his arm. And he came in and he said, how are you making all of these sounds? I Ooh. said, well, here it is. I've been doing it for television commercials. I wasn't really loving doing making sounds for crazy daisy toilet paper mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and trans-caribbean airways and stuff but it kept me going mm -hmm. but uh, he came into the studio and this, this last thing i remember we were in california and it was five years later wow five wow. albums later yeah we did uh yeah we did a whole what bunch albums, of albums, what albums did you do? uh inner visions music of my mind Whew. talking book and fulfilling this wow those are the albums we did amazing yeah, but you said you said somewhere that he, he showed up with 250 songs because Motown had kind of, because of the obvious reasons being Motown, they'd kind of wanted him to not be Stevie Wonder. They wanted him to be... Well, you know, th it was an interesting time. Steve had a lot of songs in his head. I don't know if it was 250 songs or 500 songs. Mm -hmm. We never let the tape recorder stop a two-track running in the studio all yeah. the time. Yeah. But... Uh, you know, we were so in the moment of it that we really didn't realize, you know, the historical exactly. aspect of what we were doing. Absolutely. Stevie had just reached his majority. He had turned 21. His contract with Motown as an adolescent, as an underage person, had expired. Wow. And uh, he decided that he wanted to uh, be on his own. Motown had what they called the Motown Style School. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. it was Martha and the Vandellas. Yep. It was sure uh, was. you know, and they had a house band, mm -hmm. and everybody performed in front of the house band. Everyone Four was brothers. sort of disciplined in a style of music yeah. that was acceptable to white audiences. Mm -hmm. And the Motown acts would go in through the kitchen and play for the white audiences, yep. and then they'd leave through the kitchen. They'd never really. It's absolutely correct. And in order to be sort of acceptable in that audience, they did everything from getting dressed suits to and suits, suits, suits yep. Yep. and those uh, rhythm those yep. sort of dance steps mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. And Steve never really he didn't buy liked it. any of it. He didn't buy it. Nope. nope. And he says, you know, I have enough. I'm going to New York. Mm -hmm. He heard our record. We came in the studio and we were able, to, and I have to say, if I didn't have the synthesizer, I wouldn't be sitting here mm -hmm. right now. Why? Amazing. Because the technology drives the art. Mm -hmm. And what we did, we were able to bring the synthesizer to rhythm and blues. Mm -hmm. Mm. And uh, Steve jumped in with both feet, of course. And to this day, I have to say, it's very interesting because it's the tanto was the only in instrument to this day that was played by three people at the same time. Normally, if you go in the studio, one guy has a guitar, one guy has the bass, and the other guy plays the keyboards, mm -hmm. right? And they get together and they make music, mm -hmm. right? With tanto, there it is. 
we were able to play simultaneously at the same time the bass line leave, leave that up for me I have no, I leave that up that's very important go ahead uh, um, Stevie we would set up the synthesizer in such a way that uh, Stevie would be playing a bass line but that bass line would be transposing the entire synthesizer so while he was playing the bass line if I could if I played a chord or two or three notes at a time, I could never make a mistake because the entire instrument was transposing with the bass line. Mm. And we were f monkeying around with the filters. Of course, our automation was what I call Armstrong automation, you know, mm -hmm. do it by hand, mm -hmm. right? And um, so it was three people playing the instrument at the same time. Mm. And it's a very much more kind of an interactive feeling. Sure. Modular synthesis, which, which is what this is, uh -huh. you don't just walk up to it and say, okay, I'm going to change this oscillator. you got to patch the oscillator in. you got to modulate it with another. Every module is like a knob today or a, a little plug in. Yes. Look at that. I mean, why is it that, I'm not a synthesizer player, but why is it that people worship those? They're like making a massive comeback Because they right sound now. fantastic. Mm. That's why. Why do they if sound fantastic? you can never fantastic? get a sound out of one. Well, because of its imperfection. That's what makes it sound great. Mm -hmm. It is not, you know, you take a sample, right? Say a t snare drum sample. Mm -hmm. You play it at the beginning of the song to the end of the song, it sounds exactly the same, mm -hmm. right? This instrument, we could go through a sound and we say, don't, don't touch it, that's a great sound. And I'd say, oh, well, let's just take this a little tiny bit more. Gone. The sound goes away and you never get back to it. Mm. Right, mm -hmm. so Stevie, you had how to. How did he interact? Did, 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 did he fall in love with, with synthesized versions of real sounds, or did he get more excited about well, sounds that didn't exist? Let me be in clear. Nature? Let me be clear about synthesized sounds of real sounds. What you're talking about is synthesized sound of a real sound is called a sample. Well, no, no, this is saying, when you. Did he say to you, "Give me a, a, a flute-like sound, or give me a"? Yeah, he would say that, and or I would say that, or I, Stevie uh -huh. would come up with the sound. I say, "Steve, that sounds like a doorbell." You know, that, that's not a good sound, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We had a very free and easy relationship. No one else came around. It was just the three of us in the studio. Mm -hmm. Who was in the third member? It huh? was Stevie, Cecil. you, and who else? Malcolm, Malcolm Cecil. Cecil. Gotcha. Bob, when Stevie would, was first uh, introduced to this, would he ask for sounds that sounded like a flute, or would he, would he ask for sounds that would just didn't exist in nature? What, what was his... We, we would say they were sort of like families of sounds. Well, I need some sort of like a bass sound. Well, oh, Steve, okay. what's the song about? Uh -huh. What mm -hmm. kind of texture are you looking for? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Then Malcolm came to it more from the, originally from the engineering side. I came from the programming side. Gotcha. Tonto did not look like this. Mm. It looked like a regular Moog 3 times 2 or 3 stacked up on an old gurney which you used to bring you know like they use at the morgue mm. right it, i'd wheel it into the studio uh, it got like this when we took the synthesizer to electric lady mm -hmm. uh, and there's where i met john storick who built electric lady for jimmy and he also built this cabinet for us Going back to, keep it mm. on stevie yeah so uh but we would um I tried to sort of find out what was going on in his head, right? Would you, Me and would Malcolm you had a deal. Or something beforehand? No, or? no. So some of the stuff written in the studio, some of it totally in his head, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Like Superstition, for example. Mm -hmm. What was the first track he put down on Superstition? Clapping it. The drums. Wow. The entire song was in his head, okay? Mm -hmm. Was there any click track? No. Mm -mm. Because he had the whole thing sort of figured out. Mm -hmm. But he would work on lyrics in the studio, Stuff, a lot of stuff was created in the studio, and a lot of stuff would get sort of inspired by the sounds that we were making. Just I want to be clear about the difference between sampling and electronica, mm -hmm. okay? Sampling is when you take a recording of somebody else's recording, an instrument, a recording of somebody else's drum kit, right? And you take that recording and you dice it up, and then you suddenly have an instrument based on samples. Well, right. here's a great piano sample, and it's a, what's the sample of all? It's a Bosendorfer piano in, in Vienna, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Great sound, right? That's not synthesis. Synthesis is taking sounds from vibrating electrons, 
from taking sounds from space that do not live in the real world at all. Mm -hmm. Where is the performance of electronica? The performance is the record. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is the actual creation of sounds in space that occur inside a musical instrument that you inhabit. Mm -hmm. The musical instrument that you inhabit is called a recording studio. It's like being in the belly of an acoustic guitar. Mm -hmm. How does that room sound? You know from your experience in the studio how important it is that the room have a good response, Critical. that it has the right speakers, that it has the right geometry, Absolutely. and everything else, because that's the only instrument that you live inside of, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The other instruments and all the people live inside a musical instrument where some sort of communal activity happens and we make our folk music, okay? Our folk music, the laptop computer, that is the folk instrument of today. Huh. It really Say that is. Again. That is so cool. So we're we're moving. The thing that's important about music is it never stops evolving. Never. I mean, think about the drum kit in 1945. It had a low hat and a hi hat. Okay. Mm -hmm. Look at the difference in the size of the kick drums, for example. And, uh, and now there's no drums. It's mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, I got a great sample of this, that, this, and the other. Right. Mm -hmm. The thing about Tonto, which I think fascinated Stevie, was the fact that we were making sounds that did not exist in the real world. So we were able to tie our sounds to his fantasies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was really what the, the lock was. Particularly in Stevie's mean. case, in that it's so much, instead, in other words, he's not getting visual cues. He's literally living inside his head. So to have somebody with a, with a machine, a musical instrument, that could literally mm -hmm. get to sounds that you aren't, aren't informed by what you see. What yeah. was inside Stevie's head was completely unique yeah. to his thing. So it you know, it's like a, her, you, you take. Um, go ahead. Um, I, I I'd, I'd been exposed to synthesizers very very early on, and I kind of knew what they were. But when I heard one of the first records that Bob did with Stevie, I didn't hear synthesizers. Right. I heard music. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's what. Bob contributed among many no, things. That's the early on to, to to making synthesis. You and Stevie, and, and uh, Malcolm, uh, that's what made it acceptable as a musical form was the fact that you took all of that and and and, and when I heard the record, I didn't hear synthesis. I heard music. So, that's so hard. question for you. So, well, so if you take that predicate and then you move it forward, because oftentimes when you're dealing with technology and it's cutting edge, and as you said, you know, sometimes when you're living in the moment, you don't even realize what's going on. You're just creating and doing things that we do as creative people. You don't listen to the sound of your own wheels. Uh, you just you just drive, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, you just drive. So, along the way, because you work with so many seminal artists, are there places where you learn from them? Absolutely. Yeah. Who were some of them? Uh, well, obviously from Stevie, sure. from Richie Havens. Mm -hmm. From Tito Puente. Oh, yeah, amazing. I loved his I wouldn't rhythm. think of Tito amazing. and Richie Havens as, as synthesis people. And what, did, what would you learn? I was playing a little bit of synthesizer with Richie, but you say people I learned from. Yeah, and what kind of stuff did you learn from them? Well, I learned also the effect of you'd say the, it was just music. I didn't know where the real instruments stopped and the electronica began. Mm. There were live instruments in there in, the, in those recordings. Sure. Okay? Sure. Right now, I'm doing a lot of listening to the clavichord classical clavichord, mm. okay, mm. from, um, you know, in Holland, the, the guy plays the real instruments were recorded, uh, built in the 17th century, Wow. okay, Wow. and then I listened to Superstition mm -hmm. and the clavinet, mm -hmm. okay, and I see this line of development from an instrument that is very primitive, but Bach wrote on the clavichord, he did not write on an acoustic piano that right. was in, invented until Beethoven's right, time. Right. But somehow all this music lives like that, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. But you find that the musical instruments, whether it's a synthesizer or a clavinet, drives the sound that we have the expectation of, mm -hmm. drives the, the music forward in a new way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, rap, for example, mm -hmm. could not exist without the sample. Right. Okay, right, right. so or the synthesizer, pardon? Or the synthesizer? Or the synthesizer? The synthesizer changed the music. What is our next 
my question is, and of course I can completely wave my hand, hands in the air, is the fact that what is the next big defining disruptive moment in music? That's what's exciting. And I will tell you what it is. It is VR and immersive audio on headphones. So talk about your work in that space. We have had, I'll tell you a funny story about us. Um, one of our sponsors is DTS, and they had they had a demo room, it's a gorgeous room, and I think it was 11.1 <laughs> surround or something, and the headphones. So we walk in, full Pensado compliment. It's Dave, myself, yeah, okay. his assistant, Chongor, and we come in and they, they want to work with us and utilize our platform, and we know audio, right? Yeah. So we sit down and they give us kind of the regular version. We don't have headphones on. And then as we're sitting there, we put the headphones on us, and then they do the, the sort of VR surround thing. And the exact we, same thing we just heard. And, and we stop them and go, wait, um, it's not coming through the headphones or something like that. Is that what we said? Yeah, I could Because we could I, not. I thought my headphones weren't working. I right, we was like, it's not speakers. coming through the headphones. And they just sort of laughed. They said, no, yes, it is. Like the, the te So, so to, to that point, I remember the first time that we did virtual reality, and how important audio was in that space to the experience. When we went to Google, I actually went to Facebook, we went up and we talked to the VR people there, and they were talking to us about how important audio was in the space. So you work in it, what are you seeing? What excites you about the space? Well, uh, it's very exciting in a way. It's, uh, in certain ways, it's, um, it's hard to develop a group empathy with VR because uh -huh. everyone's wearing a mask. Right. But once you live inside that space, you inhabit that space, you understand that, uh, uh, and you're able to control the directionality. Now, a lot of the original work that DTS did, mm -hmm. they had a thing called DTS Records, mm -hmm. 1986 wow. or 87, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And oh, I and my that. friend Brant Biles at that time mm -hmm. mixed about, I don't know, maybe 50. Probably not. Selections, including things like Boys to Men, mm. Uh, mm. which we mixed in 5.1 at the Enterprise, oh, or as yeah. I call it, the Enterprise. <laughs> uh, um, but we mixed a lot of surround for DTS during that time, mm -hmm. a lot of titles, a lot of very interesting quad recordings from Europe, from mm -hmm. Colombia, and from uh, Deutsche Grammophon, which but with the technology, we recorded you, in quad. Where do you see it going now? Where, where do you see the applications? I see applications in film, I see applications in There's applications in everywhere. everywhere. Well, Literally. of course, we have uh, Dolby Atmos in, in the movie theater. For roller coasters. Right. Wow. Yeah. yeah. We have that. Yeah. Okay. But we have now gotten to a place where we can deliver really good headphones surround and earphones. Mm -hmm. uh, it, can, it makes the experience extremely personal. Now, if you have those headphones on, which we did, without goggles, we had just an oral experience. We didn't need to have a visual experience that was amazing. So you can have it with the virtual reality thing, or you could have it just as now, something oral. The thing is I this. I think it's not an experience without the audio. You've got to have that, that you, audio oh, for sure. to have the, the visual Yeah, the question is, is, the yes, question is can you have it without you know, the visual? Uh, for the last yeah. two years, Mm -hmm. I have made a tremendous effort to do music only in headphone surround. Mm -hmm. And I have gotten the most vacant stares mm -hmm. <laughs> I have ever gotten in mm -hmm. my life. People Including a few from me. Yeah, a few from you, a few from other people. Some people cannot hear it because right. of their own, what we call HRTF, headphone response transfer function. Mm. It's how our brain decides where a sound is coming from. You know that I'm talking to you right now and mm -hmm. your head is turned toward me sort of semi turned toward mm -hmm. me so one ear is getting my voice mm -hmm. earlier than your sure. other ear mm -hmm. and also there is a difference in the EQ mm -hmm. from one ear to the other mm -hmm. that is called crosstalk right and our brain is able to Process decipher it. the crosstalk mm -hmm. in such a way we take it for granted okay but that crosstalk is what enables our brain to decide where the sound is coming mm -hmm, from. Mm -hmm. It's a very powerful um, function. Absolutely. Because in our primal days, if sound came from behind you, you viewed it as a threat. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of emotion tied to spatial relationships. Absolutely. When we invented recording, we had to ditch it because we couldn't store it. Mm. An electrical process was not there. We went through the home theater, but a kid, 19-year-old kid, is not going to have a home theater, mm -hmm. okay, even if it's a little tiny one. But we can deliver this kind of experience once again 
in headphones, mm -hmm. all right? Mm -hmm. The system I'm working with now called Hear360 enables us to do it without having any specialized anything on the headphones, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. It's baked into the recording. Mm -hmm. But I can sit there with my friend Pete Mills and decide where the sound is going to come from. Mm -hmm. Where did I learn this? I learned it with Stevie. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we built a quad control room, it was back in the 80s, and they were saying, oh, we're going to have quad music now, it's going to be fantastic. And we're going to build these quad control rooms because we're doing movies anyway, and that's just starting to happen in the movie theaters. And they developed a system called SQ, which they had hoped, or QS, they had hoped we were able to get quad in, um, onto vinyl. It didn't work. Okay, the crosstalk was so high there was no way of separating the audio. Mm -hmm. But what did it do for me? Well, I had a quad control room and I had Stevie Wonder sitting in the middle of the control room and I was able to put the Fender Rhodes in front of him and the clavinet over here and the uh, guitar over there and Polino da Costa mm -hmm. in behind Amazing. me and the background vocals behind me and I didn't have to use reverb and echo, which are devices we use to create the illusion of space and depth. Mm -hmm. And I was able to have Stevie inherit, inhabit the same space as the music, to be inside the record, not as a presentation, presentational object there, mm -hmm. here's the music and here I am watching the picture frame, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But to be able to actually inhabit the music mm -hmm. inside the space. It sort of really started to remind me of architecture mm -hmm. in a way where I could see the forms. And now when I sit and do something in 12.1 headphone surround, mm -hmm. I have five channels of overhead sound where yeah. I can say I want the percussion to come up over here like this. Right. And the background vocals, the high vocals there, the low vocals down over here, and the, you're going to inhabit the same space as the music. What, what are, are there any like um, medical or are there any other applications like with, with autism, for example? Yes, as a matter of fact, strange you should mention that. I've just finished uh, a VR with head tracking which is mm -hmm. you can do with the thing where you can actually, the, you can turn the head, the music's playing over here and you mm -hmm. turn your head here and the, there's the music playing in front of you, you go like this and it's still over there, mm -hmm. right? Where everything head tracks because of the gaming mm -hmm. thing. Yep. And you know, music only mm -hmm. thing again, here finally I have found the road for music only through VR. Mm -hmm. Because through VR it's bringing music to a new place, people are gonna write in a new way. Absolutely. What does it do for kids with the autism? We just did a very, very interesting 20-minute uh, piece uh, performed and played and produced, co-produced with autistic kids. Wow. And it really helps them learn yeah. because it so enables... So they played the instruments. Yes, yeah, played the instruments mm -hmm. and sang. Mm -hmm. And what it does is it allows them to really... They can express themselves. To really concentrate on one thing at a time mm -hmm and to understand it and live inside of it. Mm -hmm. And it really brought a lot of these kids out. out. Um, it's really therapeutic and really, really wonderful. Yeah, we have a mutual friend, uh, Karen Lee, whose grandson is autistic and, you know. They call it on the spectrum. On the, on the, I was going to say that, on, on the spectrum. And Let me explain, explain what you guys are talking about. There's a range. A of, range of autism. Of autism. You go from Asperger's to, and, it, 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 and I know that because Aretha, utilizes animals. So we have autistic kids come out when she horse trains and their reaction mm -hmm. to a different stimuli is something that they can be impacted by. Say the word autism? No, no, you're fine. You're yeah. fine. But when the ones who've dealt with music or dance, and in Karen's case it was painting and took somebody who wasn't really communicating and he won a, he won a national contest because he, he could express himself through paint. He could focus and see his craft come back. So we've seen a lot of stuff in the yeah, music kind space. Of, a lot of them are what we call savant. Oh, okay. absolutely. Whereby so they, they have... they play pretty good, I mean... Yeah, oh, yeah. Sometimes? They, yeah, That's they're like a genius musician. Yeah. But they can't feed themselves. Right. And, and okay. also, sometimes so. what they're hearing is unique to them. So it may be genius. It takes people like you and me and, and, and others to, to recognize that while it might not be conventional, it is absolutely unique and, and special. So From your experience, what was, the last re what was the lasting result of that? Did they... Did they, they first of all, it helped them. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. number one. But I think it's also, the film has not been released. I only finished it two weeks ago. Oh, cool. Okay. But um, 
uh, a very wonderful man named Bob DeMarco was really behind it. He has a son who's uh, autistic, mm -hmm. and he was able to, um, uh, he really be, he was very dedicated to seeing this happen the right way. They actually have a school that they are teaching filmmaking in yeah. and teaching VR filmmaking. The VR part of it really brings the tactility of the experience yep. very close in. Absolutely. And it's an incredible tool for that. Chongor, give us a question for Bob. We got some good ones. This is from Jim Isaac. What is your favorite synth today, and do you have any soft synths that give you an analog experience? Uh, if it makes a sound, I'm into it. There you go. <laughs> Plain okay. and simple. It's very, very simple. Um, the thing that bothers me a lot about modern synthesis is that it's too perfect. Mm -hmm. um, Tonto was not a perfect instrument. I mean, I can remember we went with Billy Preston once to, uh, to do a midnight special. Mm -hmm. And we tuned up the whole synthesizer and brought it in with all the wire sticking out of it and everything. And I got it all perfect during the day. Then the minute they turned on the lights for the broadcast, <laughs> the thing went bananas. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it wasn't quite as easy as it looked. But the thing that made the bass sounds so terrific, for example, was the fact that they were imperfect. We didn't maybe get the full octave. Maybe it was just a few cents out mm -hmm. from one octave to two octaves to three octaves. Mm -hmm. But the imperfection is about what music is. I mean, if you take a drum kit, a regular drum kit, right? The guy plays a snare drum, it's mm -hmm. not the same from beginning to end because he hits the drum in a different place. Mm -hmm. right. So exactly right. even there, even that little kind of variation is something that appeals to us. The problems with the drum machine uh, is that everything is perfect. And sometimes that's not what no, things not. need to happen. It takes away feel. Chongor, give us another one. This one's from Ted Skolitz. What was your biggest takeaway from working with Stevie Wonder? Uh, what was question. the biggest takeaway <laughs> from Stevie? Uh, to be like the rocks in the water as a producer, I think. Mm. To know that Stevie is the rock and I was the water, and, and I flow around, around the rock. Mm -hmm. like and that. the thing, what does a producer do really? What did I learn? I learned that my job was to get the artist to perform to the limits of his potential. Mm -hmm. And the real, my real job was to make sure that that happened, whether it was being all the instruments up and playing, mm -hmm. or when we were in the studio or there were people around that were bothering Whatever him. it is. Whatever yeah. it is, whatever it took, to get Stevie to play. Living just enough for the city, for example, um, uh, he just wasn't singing angrily enough, so Malcolm would keep stopping the tape recorder until Stevie really got pissed off. Oh, where's my tea and honey? No tea or honey, sing the damn vocal. The boy is born. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly. Like that Mississippi. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. right. Now, now until, that you say until that, he I was, hear it. And that, until he was really pissed off. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What else happened during that time? I just should relate because you were talking about the image, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. of Stevie creating images. Uh -huh. We made movies. Those films, those songs were movies. They had yeah. New York, just like I remembered and it, right? you could hear New York in the record. Right. Absolutely. That was a movie. Yeah. Or no like question. a radio drama, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I see that sort of happening in rap a lot now mm -hmm. in a strange oh, way. Oh, absolutely. But it all evolves and changes. Oh, absolutely. All right, Mr. Batter's Box. Okay, i got to get one more thing in. All right. Um, so you went from this loved, beloved guy who did Stevie Wonder to this question guy that did Devo, <laughs> what, would, what was your reaction when everybody heard Satisfaction by Devo on Saturday Night Live and hated the band, hated everything associated with the band? It must have felt great to know that you'd push things, push the envelope again. And then Whip It comes along and it's like incredible. As a matter of fact, I just recut it with Lexi Baker a new version of Whip It in headphones surround. Oh, but cool. what was going through your mind like, like during with that the, time With period? the Bougie Boys? Yeah. First of all, it really is an R&B record, okay? Uh -huh. I used a lot of the same devices that I would use in making an R&B record with this. I just substituted other sounds, okay? Mm -hmm. More mechanical, more mechanical and more energetic. What are they talking about? Devolution mm -hmm. is the word where Devo comes, That's from, it comes from, okay? Yeah. And they're talking about the chemical pollution, uh, water pollution, 
air pollution and, and, and things that were like affecting them as and, and don't don't forget this critical point that on this picture that you see in the back of the screen you see all those little boxes and things like that those little things that look like spermatosa are, are spermatosa, spermatosa. Yes. <laughs> absolutely clocks and sperm and they're saying how are we evolving or devolving mm -hmm. and uh the interesting thing is again here so next time i have sex they so are they're truly they're truly inspired <laughs> yeah. guys and they came to the record plant for the first time. I have to tell you, they got out of the two Volkswagens where the windows were blacked out, <laughs> right? And they got out of the thing that, I think they were doing a film or something, but they were wearing hard hats with little metal canisters strapped to the hard hat with a plastic tube going up their nose. Nice. Okay. And, jump and they suits. were in black, in jumpsuits, right? Nice. And of course, Rose Mann and all these people, you know, they, they, they cannot be <laughs> affected like by anything that goes in there. I love okay. to Rose for that. Yeah, 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 no, she is like totally She's unaffected. Rose, no, even she was going, what? She's like, what the hell? <laughs> you know? Ed. But we went in there and we started working. But that was a band that took rehearsing. I wanted right. to be prepared to know what happens. I wanted to bring modern sounds to them. But again, it's the rocks and the water. Right. Okay? Right. I float around. Mark Mothersbaugh is like a total genius. Right. I mean, to this day, he makes wonderful film scores, all right? Mm -hmm. So it's really knowing when to be present and also when to be quiet. Batter's box, sir. Let's roll it. Drum machines. Yes, not a machine. Uh, I should have known better, David. Absolutely. You got me. I'm going to dig out of this one here. Okay. Uh, virtual synthesizers. Again, if you can play it in some way, affect it, even if you can do it with thought process and not have any kind of tactile oh, like connection to like it, that. it's yeah. all right with me. Right. Bass. What is our tribal, it's our yeah. tribal music. You'll, you'll You're two rewarded order, for two brevity, order. remember about oh. <laughs> Bass. Pete Mills. Uh, bass? Give me a shout out, Pete. I'd say Boogie on Reggae Woman. Ooh. Woo! Come back. Uh, I know the pattern to that, actually. That's crazy. Whip it. Whip it good. Wicked. Whip it into shape. Yeah. That's it. Uh, modular scents. I love them. Vocals. Get it right the first time. Mm. DAWs. Take your pick. I, I'm not, I, I have no opinion of DAWs at all. Mm. Uh, Wow, this is a tough one. If your studio caught fire and you couldn't rescue Tonto, Tonto was already safe in Canada somewhere, what one piece of you would you rescue? Pete Mills. Pete Mills, of course. <laughs> but also, what piece of gear I'd rescue? I'd take the master tapes off the machines and run like hell. Mm. Mm. Uh, uh, an instructive time for our audience. Uh, it's really important. We think that people understand that the spirit of the music that's made today is connected to the spirit that was made yesterday. And that sometimes if you just go back and research that and see the connective tissue and see how the envelopes gets pushed, you can actually enhance where you are today with the tools you have. And these kind of these kind of shows really do that. Yeah. Thanks for coming, man. Oh, it's my great pleasure. The, the, the I hope I didn't talk your heads no, off. No, no, no. Listen, I, you show. can't. Yeah, you can't out talk Dave and I. We're just we're muting ourselves <laughs> ordinarily. But but the but the other side of it is is I think that for all of us, including the audience, when you think about the times in our lives that we've done things and been inspired by and got through tough things through records and contributions that you've made stuff to. It becomes way more personal to so start to think about those songs and go, oh, that marked this passage in my life. And your choice of that sound that Stevie took and all of a sudden was in my car a hundred times mm -hmm. while I figured out my first prom date, whatever the case may be, is a really special craft. You know, sometimes hands. you listen to the sound of your own wheels. Yeah. Other times, you don't want to listen to the oh, sound of your own wheels. We have a bunch of those. And that's, don't and that's called inspiration. That's right. That's and that's right. very, very important. And thanks for inspiring us today. Thank you very much for having Pleasure. me. Pleasure. All right, Dave, take us home. Whew, so much. Um, I'm sitting here thinking about um, when, when, when people criticize technology, what they're really criticizing is the lack of a gifted guy 
manning that technology. Um, a lot of people have problems with synthesizers. J Jeff Beck comes to mind. Jeff Beck is a non-synthesized guy, but one of his biggest songs was Superstition, a copy of a synthesized song. And, I happened, and I happened to have recorded that with Jeff Beck. Wow. So that's amazing. And, and, and then the opposite happened. When, when, when people into technology redid Superstition, I mean, uh, Satisfaction by the Rolling Stones, it, you, you have no idea how the community reacted. Uh, there's, no, there's no problem with technology. There's no problem with, with, with the digital space. But there is a problem with the creative people using it. Uh, we've had a long, long history of, of working with, uh, with certain types of equipment and certain genres of gear. And we're just in the infancy of some. And we need a lot more creative people that can come in and take this technology and entertain us with it, make it musical, grab us by the throat and stomp our heads in the ground. And it's why we feel on the show that we have to investigate those new technologies, Absolutely. try them, even for people who get mad at us for trying it. Yeah. It's yeah. really a question of us pushing back the, the weeds and seeing what's You can't hide it. under the desk. You, you, yeah. you, you, know, got it, you, you have, have to experiment. embrace, yeah. embrace the uh, art, I've and had, art and technology work together. I've had to learn to get comfortable with new things. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Staying where you're at is, is, is the... Kiss uh, of death. Kiss of death. Don't want to end on a kiss of death, but... Uh, well, kiss of life. Was, How about the kiss of life? Yeah. We'll see you next week. Yeah. Hey, guys, thanks for hanging with us. Uh, always a pleasure. We'll see you. See you next week. Peace. Peace.